Hi everyone, welcome to that pedal show. Dan here. Mick here. Hello. 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 <laughs> Hi. Sorry. Uh, we are joined today by the wonderful Rabia. Uh, yeah, Rabia Massad, um, old friend of ours. Actually, he's not that old. We're just old friends. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> if you don't know who he is, get out from under the rock. We say it every time. <laughs> um, and it's a pleasure to see you, mate. It's been a while, hasn't it? It has been a while. It's, it's been a while. I haven't seen you. I saw you at Nam very briefly. Yeah. One night in a bar, which was fun. Um, <laughs> but I haven't seen you since before the world fell apart. Yeah, yeah. And then got back together again. So w we filmed, the last time we filmed with you. Yes. And it, you stayed at Mick's house. I did. The evening before. Yeah. And it was the first time you'd ever seen Spinal Tap. It was. I think I feel more complete as a musician. Yeah. I haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was our duty. Yeah. As soon as you said you hadn't seen it, it was like, that's what we Well, well after you got doing. over it, after you got over the fact I hadn't seen it, you were both like, what? <laughs> yeah. So a lot's happened in, in, in that time. It was literally, um, the day Ruby arrived with us was the day... The government basically said, "Don't go anywhere." Wasn't yeah. It? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did. We filmed the next day, and off you went home, and that was that. And we didn't see you for ages. And so much has changed. Yeah, big time. So, briefly, uh, Tosca is no more. Disbanded. Yeah. Um, you've got new projects ongoing. Mm -hmm. You've left Chapman and gone to Music Man. Indeed, he says, holding a fender. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about Strats. You've got a new Strat pickup set. Yep. Yeah. And the, re the first reason we came to, to to do this video today was we wanted the original, and this would be about 18 months ago. <laughs> yeah. We wanted to talk about strats in a slightly heavier context. So we'll cover some of that stuff um, yeah. as well today. In addition, Dan has swapped out. Uh, so you built this board for a beer how long ago? Oh, boy. Well, that was when it was. When we did the whole spinal tap thing, that that's day. A, that, oh, that was, was that, the re yes. that was why I was here to show yes. like heavy tones and yeah. do the board rebuild yeah. and stuff. Yeah, and uh, yeah, would be wanted a G three, so yeah. I thought I would. <laughs> but the thing is, as well, because you've got another project that you're coming up, and so all the extra media stuff, um, you know, it just was a natural progression. But I wanted to ask you because the next time I saw you after that. Mm -hmm. You said there was something big happening, but you couldn't say what it was. And then, lo and behold, watching Stormzy at Reading. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and out pops you yeah. to open the whole thing. Yeah. I only found out about that bit like two days before, a day before. Come on, tell the story then. It was horrifically scary. So I got asked to do the gig um, through Instagram. Um, no way. I almost didn't see the message because I never check Instagram messages. I don't know if you guys are the same, but I really didn't check my inbox. This Instagram you talk about, what's that? <laughs> yeah. You know, because it does message requests and you don't always see them. Yeah, so yeah, I went yeah. in and I was just checking and a friend of mine, um, Jack Duxbury, he, yeah. he was friends with the MD of the whole thing. So he was like, you need to check your messages, man. Like, so I did. Ended up having a chat with a guy called Kojo Samuel, who's the MD. Really nice guy. He asked me if I wanted to play. Uh, Reading and Leeds because they wanted to bring back the idea of it used to be an old rock metal festival kind of vibe. There's a way heavier bands back in the day, mm. um, and they wanted to reignite that kind of thing. So I was like, yeah, absolutely, because I knew I'd never listened to Stormzy, but my sister's a huge fan. So I was like, okay, it's, this is a big opportunity. So I said, yeah, went and did the pre-production and stuff, and um, I had to like arrange with Kojo the intro to the whole thing because they wanted to do like a big yeah, yeah. balls to the wall kind of riff version of one of the songs called Big Michael. So I threw together a demo at home, sent it over, and they approved it straight away. They were like, this is great. We'll just do this. So then went to do Fly By Night, which is a big production facility, uh, ran, the, ran the set. I was playing on the opener, um, a song called Blinded By Your Grace, and then Vossi Bop, which was at the end of the whole set. And the whole time we'd been doing pre-production was in a rehearsal space, but it was only in, when we did the dress rehearsal, which was two days before Lee, uh, Reading, that they were like, right, so that X in the center, you need to walk out there. So like we did the thing and I walked out and I'm like doing it and there's like pyros and stuff, but there was no one else on stage. And I sort of pulled the the, the show director to the side and went, just, is it just me at the start? They were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so I was completely like paralyzed with like fear at that point. And then right before we went on, 
Kojo, the MD's like hanging around in the wings and I'm like obviously very nervous because this is the first gig out of lockdown as wow. well. Like I hadn't played what for a couple of years. So I was pretty nervous. And it was also, I was running my quad cortex on time code. So it's being changed on its own. Right. And I've never done anything like that, relinquishing control that much. <laughs> so the whole thing's just like, oh, this is so intense. So I thought I just need to warm up on the side. And then he he, he comes over and he's like, Oh, I love these pre pre broadcast vibes side of the stage, and I was like, "So broadcast?" He's like, <laughs> "He's like, yeah, man, BBC." And I'm like, "I had no idea. I had no idea it was going to be on BBC till about a minute, two minutes before we went on." And then in your ears, you're in your monitors, you've got right backing track, walking music, and go, and you're just like, walk on stage, and it was just, it was amazing. As soon as I'd played the first note, I was fine. They wanted to do like a When Doves Fly kind of yeah. oh, octave, okay. yeah. like sort of scrappy lead intro and then kick in with the big riffs. And just as soon as the riffs came in, I was fine. But on top of all of that, at the time I'd torn my ACL. So I remember walking from the, from the bus to the stage and my leg kept like popping out. So I had this leg brace that I used and I tightened it to such a point that I couldn't bend my leg and I had to do the whole gig with you know, with a torn ACL, it was really hard to like stand there and power stance and rock out, hoping that it wouldn't, you know, give way and I'd just fall on my ass in the middle of the stage. It was terrible, <laughs> honestly, but an amazing experience. I can't believe that happened. So. That was it was incredible, and you absolutely nailed it. You did. I, yeah. We were all very excited watching it on the TV. Going, <laughs> oh my god, it's big! <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. super cool. So, yeah. I mean, previous to all of that, then you'd been doing all the stuff with Leo. Mm -hmm. And those turned into some big gigs in the end, didn't they? Yeah. So this is Leo Frogley, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It started out in sort of 600 cap venues. We did the second tour and now we're going out again in September and he's doing 4,000 cap venues. No way. Yeah, yeah. That is nuts. Yeah, it is crazy. People just love the party vibe, I think. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of flip between stories and a bit of playing. Before we get to a bit more playing, how does, um, how does it change then? So if you think pre-Leo pre-Reading Festival. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but most of the stuff you're doing is a few hundred here and there. How does the production, how does the feeling change between mm. like a decent normal gig that most of us are used to mm. and then 4,000 and then whatever it was, 40,000? Well, Reading was 90. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, f for the most part, uh, you know how it is that there's a certain number of people in the audience before, uh, at which point it kind of, just blurs into one. You don't oh, really yeah, think yeah. about it. Like the sm the Hardy gigs are the really small club venues where you it's like, everyone. you can see everyone, yeah. all their faces. Whereas like beyond, I'd say like two, 300 people, it starts to feel more or less the same. And then okay. luckily with Frog Leap, we'd done like a Nova Rock gig a few years back. Um, and that was 40,000. And you get, I'd had that, I'd had that experience once where there's so many people you can't comprehend it mm. and it just looks like a sea of that like skin colour. So at that point, I kind of, I wasn't, the gig, the Reading gig, I wasn't worried about the amount of people. I was worried about all the technicalities, you know, the time right. code, the wireless system, the you yeah. know, count ins and your in ears, which I've never had cues like that before, you know, all that stuff. So that was more f scary than... But, but you'd done production rehearsals to get a bit used to that stuff? Yeah, I mean, like, Again, with Frog Leap, we're kind of left to our own devices in the sense we've got our own rigs, we're all on in-ears, mm. and it's we were talking about earlier, like a silent stage. Mm. So as long as you don't take your in-ears out, you're all good. Um, <laughs> right. And then the bigger the stage gets, the worse that is when you take your in-ears out. Yeah, you right. know? there's nothing. No, you really know, isn't. A little tap tap of yeah. something somewhere. Yeah. I actually started getting uh, James, our sound tech, to put a wedge near me so that if ever I did feel like taking him out, I've got something. something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but like, yeah, other than that, you know, things like when we used to gig with Tosca, whatever size venues we used to do, there was a whole setup ritual because mm -hmm. you got amps and pedal boards and all the rest of it. So you get your tone before you've done anything else. Then you do your sound check, then whatever, you, the gig's the gig. Whereas with the Frog Leap stuff and even with the Stormzy thing, it's just the modeler because we that's what I had to use. Yeah. I wasn't allowed to take amps and with Frog Leap, they're all fly gigs. So you just put it down. The preset's the same preset you used the last time nothing changes so it's kind of weird like it took a long time to get used to the difference of making sure all that's set up and yeah, okay. that's set up yeah to just going presets loaded cool that's it away you go yeah. Let, let's get into a discussion of that in a minute then for now for those of you who want to hear Rabir play a bit more i certainly do we've we've been a bit naughty today 
So you normally play, like when you are, we'll get into the discussion of amps and modelers in a sec, but you normally play a stereo rig, right? Two Krakens. Yeah. Today we've we've urged Rabir to try <laughs> something different just for, the, just for the hell of it. Um, so what's happening, Dan? The Kraken is so doing... We've got the signal coming out of the, let's see, with uh, Mobius into the Volante goes into the front of the Kraken. Mm. Then we're splitting the signal in the effects loop of the Kraken. One side goes back into the Kraken, so the signal then goes to the power section into the cab. The other side comes out back into the board, into the timeline and big sky, stereo out left and right into the power amp left and right into the Zilla cab. So we do have a wet, dry, wet rig. Fully wet, dry, wet. Fully wet, dry, wet. Even though it's wet, wet, dry. Wet, wet, dry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But when, yeah. when you hear it in your ears, you'll, you will experience wet, dry, wet. We were setting up earlier. How does it feel compared to your stereo rig? A lot different. Right. It's faster, we were saying. Yeah. That. It's more immediate uh, when you dig in uh, because it's not all mixed together. Yeah. Um, and I guess on on a smaller side note, because all the effects are on that side, and I've got the sure. dry here, but that's that's sort of negligible. But what is very noticeable is the immediacy of the the dry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, do you like that? I haven't used it long enough to really know. <laughs> right. Come on, talk us through talk us through um, some basic sounds like your go to when you would plug in. Yeah. What what how does it begin? Well it's it's kind of we were saying this earlier because obviously Dan very kindly re rig rejigged the board, put the, the G3 on there. But up until very recently, um well say very recently, up until just after lockdown, it was all preset for the Tosca stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would just kind of tweak the settings if I just wanted to play. Whereas now with the new projects, I'm gonna be using a lot more single coil guitar as well in that. And I'm trying to dial in uh heavier tones for that sort of sound but in terms of what the board does one has always been a rhythm tone mm -hmm. um and then two and three are varying degrees of like wet you know so like two would be really really wet and then three would be slightly less wet and then four is just more like a bit of reverb five would have been like an octave first thing six would have been a pad and seven would have been a solo boost so that's what we've named them as you go along sorry and you can see so that's how they're set up. Bearing in mind, I'm using the Strat at the minute, so into the Kraken gain one, it's not, when it says main rhythm, that would have been a heavy rhythm. Yeah, yeah would okay. have been. So there's no overdrive pedals with just guitar amp at this point. Yeah, so this is how it sounds straight in, so. It's just, it's dry, you know? Um, one thing that I've grown to love using strats and amps is a, a compressor. I okay. really enjoy using the compressor. So underneath there is the Cali Stacked. So I'll go to number four, bit of reverb, and then just the, the compressor. I would use that sound generally for playing on my own. And then these were set up more for like uh, songs at the time. I've tried to recreate it real quick, but. Um, that kind of thing going on. But, but yeah, anyway, this is how it sounds. I would sit and play that for hours. Um, and then three is very similar. But what I'll show you, I suppose, is what the pedals are doing. So some of these are dialed in right now for a heavy Strat thing. Mm -hmm. So if I go there, throw on the compressor because it's fun. And then I believe 
That is in number seven. <laughs> Yeah, I really like that. That's the the PDF uh, from Stone Deaf. Just when Rabir was setting up, he tweaked the frequency control on the PDF. Just listen to this a sec. I'll put it back where it should yeah, be. Yeah, of course. I'll play a bit more, please. Uh, just make sure that that narrows the band. Okay. So if you if you turn that to the left and then move the frequency, yeah. you can hear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it to have a thickness, that low mid thing. Yeah. So with that band wide like that, it just gives a bit more thump. That's the bridge pickup. It's just thick. So it makes those nice and fat. That's amazing. It's cool. It's a cool pedal. It's almost like a fuzz. Yeah. At that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a bit of a gem. Like he keep putting it back on the board going, yeah, actually I need to. And that's the clean mode. <laughs> Has a dirty mode as well. So, so if you if you press that, it goes to red. So let's have a quick. I don't really have, often use it on red. Luke, if you're watching, Luke from Stone Death. Yeah, yeah legend. Yeah. Killer, so man. Good. Um, so that's kind of like, I would generally use that for, uh, with with the str single coil Strat sound, that would be like my rhythm sound. Maybe it would be slightly brighter, but that would generally be like the rhythm sound that I use for riffs. Yeah. Um, but then I have varying degrees of that. So like the Thunderclaw is a like, I love that thing. I actually put that in my neural plugin. These two are in my neural plugin. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, on the vintage mode. So that's the vintage mode. That's the modern mode in the plugin. Because they're like quite similar, but this one has a little bit, you can riff with it. Whereas this one's really chewy. Cause sure. it's, you know. So I'll give you a quick example. So. <laughs> which I really like. And then <laughs> if I go to the bender. But I usually blend that with the, the pog too. <laughs> So I'll give you that real quick. <laughs> yeah. Can can I ask? There's I've always loved a heavy Strat sound or a heavy Telecaster sound. There's something about the attack on the bridge pickup that I don't know. It just doesn't it's cave just, in. If you hear, if you listen to the, what was happening there on the front of the low strings, you get you hear the twang. It. Yeah, you can still hear the pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, which would be completely lost. Yeah, that's something I'm 
falling in love with more and more over the years. Right. Like, like over lockdown, I did a project called The Totemist and that was done all with like single coils. And right. I used Strat and Tele. I did use a Gretsch um, with a Filtertron thing. Yeah. But mainly it was it was this with actually these pickups, the first iteration of them in a Tele that I used for all the heavy stuff. And it just, it was just so much fun. Yeah. And such a different approach to heavy sounds from what I've always done, which is humbuckers. Because there is that there is that tendency, right? As soon as it gets heavy, throw humbuckers in. Yeah, but I feel like that's... Obviously, there's so many genres of music now that are synonymous with humbuckers, but also the, it's in the name. Most of the time when you turn up the gain, people need to get rid of the hum, yeah, so sure, humbucker, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like a lot of that's just the kind of done thing, but... Oh, the, I mean, like Andrew Groves from Arcane Roots was a yeah. great example of someone that did heavy tone with yeah. a strat, you know, like to and the Simon from Simon. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. You know, these guys like doing it for years before, like, I really got turned on to it, but I, I don't know. It's just really fun to carve out a sound using single calls, yeah. definitely, because there's an aggression with them as well. Like, the, there's quite a big difference between a strat bridge and a telly bridge. Like, the telly bridge is way more aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, but the two just work so well. There's a flying beast. There is a flying beast. He likes your tone. Yeah, he does. <laughs> we get this every year about this time. <laughs> We're on a farm, right? So uh, <laughs> there are flying beasts. Excuse the flying beast. It's got good taste. But yeah, um, there is then... The only other things I've got mm. going on is, uh, as I was saying to you earlier when we were messing with the board, I'm starting to chop and change more. Mm. Like, I remember when we first built the board, that, that was, was how it, it was yeah. going to be. Yeah. Whereas what I've started doing is taking stuff off, trying new stuff. So like the Halcyon is currently on there um, as a tube screamer, but I also have a second tube screamer underneath, which can you see the blue light? That's the Tempest from Fortin. And the reason that that's on there is because it has a high and a low pass. Yeah, has a high and a low pass knob on it, which I think all tube screamers should have. Fourteen, as in Mike Fourteen. Yeah. Oh uh, well. Okay. Yeah, and it, it's uh, it's actually a, a signature pedal of the Architects ah. um, that they use oh, wow. it for heavy stuff, but it's great um, because of that high and the low pass control, sure. so you yeah. can really dial it in. So. Um... So it's just adding a bit of drive. I've boosted the level so it's hitting the front, but then I've rolled off the high end so it's not quite as sharp. So it's a little less... That is amazing. It's good, isn't it? I was That's about... awesome. I was about to say, can we hear some neck pickup? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crying out for it, isn't it? Yeah. And then uh, lastly, the Halcyon. What's the Halcyon currently doing? That's in number six. That will sound like without it. And then the Halcyon. Tube screamery things. Amazing. Um, it, it does require a certain level of confidence to play those sounds. Yeah, at that sort of it's way level. less forgiving on a single coil as well. Like, yeah, yeah, but that's you don't have any fooey on there. It's all just straight in. Dana started to refer to delay and reverb as fooey. Just, <laughs> <laughs> for, for, just for time saving purposes. I like that. For context. Yeah, and I must admit that using a compressor for me is a dangerous game. Yeah. Because you get so used to yeah. using it. It's so much fun having a compressor all the time. And all those sounds I just showed you with, I didn't have the compressor on. Yeah. And I'm used to it. Right. And so it's a little bit more like you're out in the, you're out on your own now. Well, is it, there's a number of ways this discussion needs to go. One is guitars, obviously. We need to talk about straps and single coils and Music Man. 
but also amps. And the, the compression question is interesting because another thing that you did lockdown-wise was you were sort of forced to... Tosca's all loud amps, right? Mm -hmm. And then the relationship with Neural and all of that, you lived in modeling world for most of that and yeah, have come yeah. out changed, right? Yeah. Seeing the light, so to speak, Yeah, in some respects. So how does that work then? What, maybe explain a little bit about the, the lockdown process and how you got into all of that and what you've learned. Well, I mean, throughout lockdown, it was a case of, look, we got a little, there's a little swatter up there I know, too. I, know. I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Beasts, but maybe this we move them along gently. Right on the mic. Did you get him? I don't know. I didn't want to hit the mic. They're eight hundred quid each. <laughs> that was extremely no, accurate. Though. It was, but there was a, there was a. I think he was sucked in behind the yeah the the. Uh, it was a vortex. Yeah, was I really good. want to know what that sounds like through the mic. Yeah. Um, if I'd have hit it on the end, it you'll would... hear the fly landing on the mic. Yeah, you'll you hear, hear the cries. I know. You'd be like, <laughs> asshole, asshole. <laughs> That was great. I was so impressed with how you didn't manage to hit it, but it was at such velocity. I was He's really a man of many talents. Really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so like uh, the modeling thing, like obviously it's worth saying that I have some very close friends that work in Neural, firstly. Yeah. So like head of artist relations is my friend called Max, who used to tour manage, take photographs of all the bands I've ever done. And Dan Davies, who's now their CMO. And like, I've known him as long as I've known Rob, like they were like a pair that I met at the same time. Yeah. So since like 2011. What's CMO? A chief marketing officer. Oh, okay. So he's oh, in wow. control yeah. of all the marketing for yeah, Neural. Yeah. Um, so like when they brought out the quad, I like, tried the plugins and stuff before lockdown mm -hmm. and I've done videos with them and stuff like that. But being completely honest, like I would always then go back to amps and pedals and stuff like that. Um, and they're fun, but I saw them more as a cool thing that's a convenience factor when you don't have the opportunity to mic up an amp and all the rest yeah, of it on your computer. I remember going to you to get some IRs, IRs for speaker IRs because yeah. you had a lot of experience. You you tried a lot of stuff, yeah. and to the point where you had you did your own IRs. Yeah. yeah, and because when you're at home, load box. For me, I always wanted amp, and then if I couldn't have a cab, it would be a load box. Sure. But I wanted an amp to do a thing. Um, but yeah, and. So I'd try the plugins. It would be kind of cool, convenience, whatever. Like they had some cool quirks and, you know, like archetype Corey Wong, which had a cool, mm -hmm. all sorts of fun sounds. And then Quad Cortex came out and that was like, you know, it's a modeler, but it captures amps as well, which was for me a really important thing because mm -hmm. although I like, you know, I've tried a few different models, of different amps and stuff. I always like more attracted to the idea of capturing my own amps. Sure. So like, when we say capture... Like Kemper Profiler. Okay, so that's a similar process. Yeah. Rather than like on a Line 6 device or whatever, they decide what's going to happen in your amp model. Yeah. With both Quad Cortex and Kemper, indeed, you yeah. can plug the amp into the thing and it learns, basically. And it learns, yeah. And, yeah. and but, and you know, I'll just say it like, call me biased or what, but the, the Quad Cortex capture is far more accurate than anything I'd experienced before. Okay. Yeah i.e. Kemper or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like it just had more depth, the response was better. It had more of a, that feels and sounds like my amp does. Right. So I was immediately drawn to that. Okay. Uh, so when it came out, I captured all my amps, is the captures I use for Frog Leap. So it's all my, like, I use a Kraken SLO capture that are my own amps that are, I run for Frog Leap. And uh, yeah, I kind of just, because <clears throat> it's- What does it's, that look like? Do you need mics and stuff to do that or do you Well, just... I just took the load box out, you know? So you just take what, the load box would be sent then into the computer, you know, with your IRs or whatever. I just take the load, the line out of the load box, uh, in. Okay, and so, it captures everything that's in the front as well. So yeah. you were saying you, you can put drive pedals in the front, in the pedal. right? Yeah. So for any of you who understand this, it might seem like a very simplistic discussion, but for those of you who don't understand it, hopefully it will help. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, it can capture fuzzes and overdrives and okay. all sorts yeah. of stuff like that. So I was able to build my rig digitally with inside QC, which is great. You know, could have cap, uh, krakens mm -hmm. with fuzzes and overdrives in front and get get a very similar vibe, you know, like, so it was fun. And it sits on your desk. So like when you sat at home writing and you can quickly dial in, oh, I need delay in front and grab the blade. It's got an iPad style right. touch yeah, screen. Yeah. So it's just super intuitive, whatever. But then... Then I got the opportunity to make a plugin with them, which was like uh, even more going down the rabbit hole mm. of how it all works and getting to go there and see how it's done and 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 then pick my own gear choices for the plugin and, and all that stuff, you know? So yeah, coming out of lockdown now and having released that last year and stuff, like I, 
in my head, if I'm playing in an originals band, like I'm going out and playing on stages and stuff, I need a, I need a cab. We were talking about this yeah, earlier. Yeah. I need the raw of speaker cabinets to to give me something like that. I just know that's how I feel best playing original music, whether it was Tosca or any new project. But where I absolutely can't deny the value in modeling or plugins for me now is as a production tool. Mm. Like I'm sitting at home and I'm th writing music and thinking of all these cool layers and ideas that I could throw in the arrangement. It's so quick. Like, right. It's so quick to just quickly dial something in or whatever and then get that sound that's in your head. And I th there's so many songs and stuff I've recorded now that I think if I had to wire up a rig in the analog domain and, try and, and then that. track it, yeah. it would take me so much longer. Sure. Mm. So for me, that's the, the value in it massively. Right. And and on top of that, I suppose if you know the feel of them is really good. Right. Yeah. You know, they've they've really nailed the feel. So you know when you dig your pick in, it gives you the thing that you kind of expecting. Right. Like there's a thump to it that you kind of. Uh, the only way I can describe it is that like thump, that ampy thump. Mm. Yeah. If that makes any sense. I'm, I'm interested to understand the context of that because uh, if you spend, I'm trying not to make this a leading question, but <laughs> if you, so you're spending a lot of time in your studio with monitors mm -hmm. and headphones and a certain SPL mm -hmm. and you kind of get used to that and then maybe some of the bigger gigs is all IEMs anyway. Yeah. Mm. So you're here, what you're essentially hearing all the time is a kind of a recorded type sound. Yeah. Rather than being stood in front of a cab. So I totally get it from a studio perspective and maybe even on big stages perspective, because your experience of the gig is coming yeah, through, essentially through, yeah. through headphones. Mm. <clears throat> how does it matter? How does it feel in the room? Like, how is there a way in which you can get the quad cortex loud through a cab that you enjoy? Well, you could put it, it through the effects return of an amp because you can just load up a capture of a preamp yeah. or a preamp model. So obviously inside QC, you have to load up an amp and then yeah, a yeah, cab, yeah. otherwise it'll yeah. sound terrible. Yeah. Um, so you could do that and run it out into the effects return of an amp and get to listen to that. Like, we've but, done that quite a bit. That's fun. But what about through just a straight FRFR oh, right. application system? So you take your... Uh, quad cortex yeah. and plug it into a PA speaker and use that as long as it's a good a... speaker right. yeah and you're happy with that feels good and I mean for the most part yeah yeah being completely honest you yeah. know I've tried a few different ones um and yeah as long as it's loud enough yeah right. so okay. that you get that because okay. amplifiers are unruly loud yeah. you know yeah, yeah. they just start like we're sat in here and it's loud yeah so you need to get that to fit to get the kick back and the feed back yeah, yeah. The, the whole experience yeah. I would and say part of that part of that feedback is you know like this is a fifty watt kraken, mm -hmm. and part of that feedback is that fifty watts right on the edge. Mm. As you dig in, it caves in. Mm. You know, it's it's not incredibly efficient. No, and that's gives you that feel. So to replicate that, through that's a, what they model though, a, isn't it? Yeah, they exactly. Model all that stuff. They model all that stuff. But to replicate that to get that accurate, you have to have a. a a full range response speaker that's capable of enough power to actually yeah. to accurately, you know, transmit that exactly what's going yeah. on in that. Yeah, right. I mean, as some people use like these, but you've got one up there, I think that Fryette thing. Power yeah. station, yeah. Yeah, see, so people use that into a cab, right. get the same experience. Right. So it's either FR, FR cab, or you do something like that. Yeah. The so CMOD on power stage sure. or whatever. So you've got a guitar speaker, basically. Yeah. Not a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which can really help. I would say with the in-ears thing, just going back to something you said earlier, like I've heard bands using QC and it feels like what they've done is taken their album presets and use them live and it sounds terrible. Right. Okay. It doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. What I've learned when I'm using it for live purposes, I leave it almost, I don't really use a heavy EQ on it because yeah, there's a tendency to like put Make an EQ it and carve it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I don't do that. I leave right. that up to James, sound guy, and he yeah. just carves out what he needs for the live purpose and it feels more... Well, it sounds bigger right. for me. Because we were saying this earlier, we went to see Carnival on their last tour recently. And I was chatting with a few of my friends and we talk about guitar sounds when we see bands live. And a lot of them are using models these days, QC specifically. And it's like, it does sound great. But when I leaned into them and I just said, you know, that's why it sounds huge because he's running a 5150 and it's cranked on stage yeah. and he's running a JCM and it's cranked on stage. And it just gives you that extra thump, that power. Yeah, that low mid resonance thing that happens with a cab on stage. And also, if you've got 
you know, if the drums are acoustic, and yeah. and because he's such a great drummer, Steve and, Jude. Yeah, and he just and he it's like if you've got a drummer that has that much power, mm. and and you don't have something on stage to, that can sit with that. Yeah, you know, if you it's like um, I've been to gigs and at the front of the stage where. It's a silent stage, but there's a loud drummer, <laughs> and all I can hear is drums. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. You it's need the, to be back a bit. It's yeah, the yeah, weirdest yeah. thing. Yeah, but like Carnival is, is a great example. You know, they're, they're a band that mix themselves on stage. Yeah, and it yeah, just, yeah. it's such a powerful thing. That's how it, me and Dave used to do it. We yeah. used to mix ourselves on stage with Ben to yeah. make sure on stage it had a good sound. Yeah, but you know, I would say coming out of lockdown, coming out of that period. Um, I have just as much valid use base now, yeah, sure. use case for modelers and plugins uh, as I do for amps and pedals. Yeah, that's, uh, a, that's a sort of grown up's conclusion, isn't it? It's yeah. Like, yeah. It's like, actually, in the right context, it's all good. Yeah. yeah. We, we've yet to find the context, is, is probably where we are, because we don't play on big stages and we don't spend yeah. our, our lives producing and making music. So, But I guess like you've got the means in here to diet, to build any kind of analog rig you want and yeah. it's just like the dream is whereas the dream. if you have like a, a little model a box that has a plethora of effects and pedals yeah, yeah, and amp yeah. models yeah. and stuff you can kind of take that same sound design approach and do it yeah, in that, yeah. You know. we get that in the comments actually yeah. um thanks everyone for all the comments you leave quite often someone will say you know i'm exclusively a digital player but actually the stuff i learn on the show really helps me dial in, dial put my in. presets and yeah. stuff together so yeah yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I, when Rabia arrived, we said, "Have you brought your quad cortex?" And he's like, "I didn't think I'd be allowed." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I genuinely didn't think it. I thought you'd you'd, you'd shun me out of the place. No, no, no. We wouldn't. We wouldn't. I was sort of. I, there's a, there's a, a small side of me that was kind of hoping that you did, but anyway, you did. I will do. So. That's just an excuse for another yeah, reason yeah, for me to come down. It is. It yeah, is. yeah. Um, all right then. So uh, the dual crack and rig we know about, we've explained what we're doing here today and how mm. that differs. I guess guitars then. We touched on it with strats. Yeah. Um, a lot to talk about. Obviously, Rabir and I share a passion for uh, for strats. And whenever he I hear him playing a strat, it's like, wow, I'm hearing him play. Yeah. And, th and hearing one thing and I look down and it's, it's another thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this is your custom shot 55, right? Yeah, I've had this. This is my uh, one I've had the longest. Mm. Have I you felt know. the neck on it, Dan? Yeah, I have. It's, it's mad. It is amazing. Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> so I remember Rabia talking about strats and him just getting into them when we did the Boss show mm. yeah. years ago. And I we'd done our thing and we're having a chat and I hear this guitar sound. I'm like, what the flipper neck is that? And then it's you on that, but playing like, your heavy stuff and it just sounded epic <laughs> yeah. and that's the first time i'd heard you play on that yeah so what i mean how did that happen especially knowing is that knowing you with the you know the heavier really dynamic stuff mm. how did the strat happen uh being completely honest it was being introduced to philip sace wow because yeah. i like everyone has their gateway artist into that stuff. And like my dad's a huge Gilmore fan. And so like, it's not that I didn't know Strat Tone and all that stuff, but nothing really got me going until I heard the Peace Machine album. Yeah. I just loved the style, yeah, right. that like filthy blues rock thing, but it had a bit of the groove and it, it was just a great album. If you haven't heard Peace Machine, check it out. But some of the tunes on there and then the playing, and I was like, that's just a Strat, you know, like, yeah. so I wanted to play like that. So I bought a Strat, I had a, it was an American standard and I just wanted to get into it, but then yeah, obviously you just pick it up a lot of the time and started to develop my own thing with it and go down the rabbit hole of how heavy can I make it. And then right. seeing guys like Arcane Roots and stuff like, because we went on tour with them with Tosca and he was playing a Strat mm -hmm. into a, he was running Victory, a Sheriff and a Kraken. So yeah. uh, it's a similar world of gear. So I knew that it was possible, but um, I just love the, I love the three single coil thing. Mm. So like we, you know, we're we'll, sure we'll touch on it later. But with Music Man, I'm I'm getting a, well, I'm trying to get a, a Cutlass made, which is their version of a Strat with three single coils, and it'll have my bare knuckles in it, um, to, and use that, you know, alongside the 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 other model. Um, but just generally speaking, like I just love the vibe. I love what how that, they're so much more vocal. Yeah, right. You know, tell us about the pickups then. So, uh, Beer and I have had many discussions down the years about strap pickups. I, I think I even sent you some at one point. You were yeah, Ron Ellis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Great how did we how did we end up here then? So this what are they called? These are called the triptych. Triptych. Single coils, yeah. From bare you, knuckle. Uh you and Tim have worked together on them. Yeah, yeah, for quite a while actually. Yeah. Um because I yeah, after we spoke, I'd have made a bunch of videos trying to trying out different pickups. Yep. Um and one thing that I'd landed on was I absolutely love like early, early to mid sixties sounding strap mm. pickups. There's more of a scoop to them and they're more spanky. So you you know, I, I just preferred that. Um so I knew that that's what I wanted. But then I was like, Tim, obviously I like to play heavy stuff. So if they're too twangy, then it means that as soon as I kick in all the overdrive and fuzz and stuff, that it's just going to get wiry and, right. and harsh. So we, and but also I didn't want them to be super high output because yeah. then you lose all the dynamic and yeah. you can't get all the classic tones out of it. So there needed to be this like happy medium. So he came up with the idea of putting zinc plates on the bottom of. In fact, if I just grab, yeah, yeah, I just grab this. I was going to swap this over. Here's one we made earlier. Yeah. So if you look, this is the first prototype set because we actually pulled the zinc plate off the middle pickup. If I hold it up, hey, yeah. it'll be closest to me. Excuse the wiring, I just crammed it in there. But um, yeah, so you put two zinc plates on the bridge and the neck, and what that did was widen the magnetic field. Um, and it gave more bo it gave more thickness to them, mm. but it didn't necessarily tamper with the overall sort of sound mm. that I was after, which was that mid early to mid sixties thing. Yeah, it can be. It's, <clears throat> it's a mod that's been done for a long time. I think Lindy Fraley might have been one of the first people to do it, to put a metal plate on the bottom of the pickup. And you and sorry, just to confirm, your experience of that is what does it do to the sound? For me, it made them a little bit thicker, but right. it didn't compromise that overall sort of scooped early to mid 60s thing that I was enjoying. And it didn't compress them or boost the output in such a way that made them not as dynamic. Yeah. Um, which I really, really, um, really, really liked. I, but they were originally on all three. And yeah. I found that positions two and four, so it, something was compromised in two and four that I didn't enjoy. So right. we popped it off the middle. Did you have the RWRP conversation? Yeah. And where did you end up? I think that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I know, I'm pretty uh, sure it is. Tim did a guitar for Johnny Marr once or did pickups for Johnny Marr. Mm. And they had the RWRP in a Jaguar mm. and they decided they preferred them both the same. Normal, yeah. Right. Wind. So non hum cancelling. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Strange. All these little tiny things that make a difference. Do you know anything else about the specs? Like what the that's, magnets are? Or? Uh, I. Yes, I do. But are they Alnico? Um, <laughs> Alnico something. Oh, no, that's really bad. I should know that. No, don't that... worry. I'll put the information on the screen. <clears throat> and is that heavy form vault? Oh, no, they've got covers. And uh, the staggered pole pieces and stuff. Yeah. Vintage stagger or whatever you call it. Um, yeah. So they're, they're a little bit higher output than a traditional set of sort of your 60s voice pickups. Yeah. But overall, all I was really bothered about was getting... I could sit and play the classic, mm. you know, dynamic kind of like low to mid gain tones that I love. Or when I kick in the fuzz and the octave and the overdrive and all that stuff that it will it really absolutely works. handle it. Yeah, right. And I can play fat riffs as well. That's really cool. We'll hear, the, hear them a bit more in a, in a minute. And then right before the end of the video, Rabir was saying that, um, go to the Bare Knuckle website if you want to see the specific specs and all that, but um, specific specs even. <laughs> um, you were saying, the pick guard makes a difference. It massively does because they're mounted to the pick guard. And I think somehow, so basically I didn't know this. And the reason this is on here and forgive me, cause this is a 50 strap with a sixties plate on. So the, the, the holes don't match up. It's sacrilege, I know. I'm glad you said it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, that issue yeah, 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 no, I know. <laughs> like the reason that, that is, this is on here was cause I made videos when the pickups came out and I wanted people to hear them in a plastic plate. Cause right. most people will have plastic plates Yeah. because with that, this looks so much better. That's gorgeous. I love the way it looks without. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it it rolls off high end. Okay, so this is an anodized aluminium pick guard, which yeah. is what you would have seen on some early 50s fenders. Mm. And you say it reduces the high end. Yeah. Does that more of a roll off? Why, Dan? Uh it, well, technically it becomes a capacitor. You've got the uh, yeah, it, it be, it's the same thing as if you shield yeah. the cavity and the yeah, I mean it, it's it's a it's a tiny amount. However, you've got to remember that the, you know, the, the signal coming out of these things is tiny and all those little things will make a difference. Well, a tiny amount at 150 watts. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It, but it, it was enough of a difference that I, you know, like I'm, I don't consider myself like a super expert with it, but I could 
you can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I did some comparisons and you could hear it. Uh, sure. uh, right right at the end of the video, we're going to have some lunch. We're going to put this pick uh, guard in that guitar and then Beer will come back and play some stuff. So you'll get to hear it before the end of the vid. Yeah. For now, can we hear mm -hmm. um, the sort of gamut of clean to overdrive with some lovely... Yeah, yeah. Some, lovely, nice. some of your lovely ambience on it. Some lovely ambience. How much ambience do we want? Oh, as much as, as, much you, as you like. As much as you want to give us. Okay, we'll go with the, this one then. Sort of sound. I mean, it's not clean as such, but this is a compressor on it. And then position four, one of my favorites, if not a lot of people's favorites, you know. Love it. So that the first sound you had there, that's just um, the amp and the compressor, right? And yeah. Obviously, delay and reverb. But what that gives you from the guitar is sparkle through mm. to actually quite a nice overdrive. Yeah. Know, just from the guitar yeah. and you. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I think the thing with the compressor is for me, it makes it a little more touch responsive. Yeah. Right? Like you get the it picks out it compresses, so it picks out the little hand you know nuances and stuff when you're playing that I really I just kind of really enjoy. But yeah, the pickups, the heavier you hit them, the more it gives back, which I've tried quite a few strats and not all of them have that for me. Sure. No, it's it's quite remarkable because the high end remains there. Yeah. Mm. So you just looking at this, you've got no treble bleed or anything like that. It's no. just straight capacitors. Yeah. Um, and yet the high end remains right there. Mm. Yeah. And it remains clear and yet 
you do get that overdrive when you dig in. That's an unusual blend for a Strat pickup. Yeah. Would you humour me for a second? Yes. And play the seventy. Yeah, yeah. So, um, there you go. Thank you, sir. Oh, Dan, stop it. Oh, he's just, holding it. Here yeah. it is. I'm just going to hand revere that guitar so that uh, for the pure reason that it is also tuned to E flat. That is E flat, isn't it? This yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so these. This is a 1970 strap with 1970 pickups or 69 pickups, I think they are. Um, it's the weakest sounding strap I have, and I'm just kind of interested <laughs> in the in the difference. I think I know what I'm going to hear. Okay, let's try that. <laughs> dissimilar. I, I, I can hear what I thought I was going to hear was it doesn't seem to have the same dynamic capability that this does. Yeah. So your difference between sparkly clean and mm. quite overdrive and quite a bit that just doesn't have. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have the extra. It's it's quite weak. I mean, it sounds sweet enough. Yeah. But that, I just sorry, I just needed some context to yeah, understand yeah, yeah. what I was hearing. Yeah. And I guess that the neck on Beer's strut is bonkers. It's like a telly neck. It's, it's like a <laughs> yeah. And that's pretty small by comparison, yeah. isn't it? It's nice though. <laughs> it reminds me a lot of my dad's, like I said before. It's lovely. <laughs> but that, yeah, bridge pickup. It's like. It doesn't gain up anywhere near as no. much when you dig in. Back Just swap back quickly. Thank you, sir. So obviously there are other differences between the guitars, but that you guys have done a great job there. Do you really think so? Yeah. I really do, because quite often when you get a bit more from a strap pickup, it all starts getting too mid-rangey mm. and like it starts to sound overwound, mm. which is great. You know, people really like that. A bit bit like going to a bridge position humbucker in a way where it just gets thick in the mids like that. Mm. Yeah. But that retains the spank and the Yeah. Nice one, man. Yeah, it's really good. Really good. Did I get mixed seal of approval? I did. I did. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Well, it doesn't matter, does it? But it's it it it. Oh, but you know, like. Yeah, I just the, as they as they get a bit more as they get a bit beefier, they often get too yeah. beefy. But yeah, what a great job! It's, and it's, I guess the plate is a is a part of that. Yeah. yeah. I think it's challenging to get the balance right that yeah. you can have such a broad thing, especially if you want the ability to do heavy stuff, because you know you can. You can do the the minuscule changes between, um, you know, a little bit more mids or mm. a, li a little bit less bottom end, but actually to have such a wide range of stuff that you can do, and that's super impressive. But you don't have to have the zinc plates. Like when people order them, it's just it's my preferred setup sure. for these pickups. You oh, can okay. get you can get them without if yeah, you prefer. Yeah. But oh, that sounds amazing. I it think is. it's a great, you know, it's fairly unique, I suppose, but. You know, uh, yeah, I'm really happy with them. I think they sound they sound killer, and I I actually prefer it with the Alley Guard as well. Mm. We'll hear that before the end of the video. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, then before we break for a bit of food, um, uh, music man, <laughs> yeah, music man, oh yeah, please, because well, I didn't, I mean, knew nothing about this, we're, we're, and we're going to dish the dirt on Chapman, obviously, aren't we? All all the dirt, all that, that dirt, come out. yeah. There's no dirt. <laughs> it was just time. Uh, just to clear that up in case anyone wonders, but I've already <laughs> said a million times in socials, like, it, yeah, it just felt like a, I left Chapman before getting on board with Music Man, and it was more just to like, I genuinely wanted to explore 
that free agent thing. Do you oh, know okay. what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. I just, I was just like, because Chapman's direction and where I was trying to do or what I felt like I wanted to have from a guitar company had changed quite a bit. Um, and I just decided for me, I'd like to just sort of grow into the unknown, so to speak. And just, I just said to him, yeah, like I'm, I think it's time that I did my own thing. And they were just like legends, both Rob and Lee were just so nice about it. And Rob was like, I'd do the same, like not in a kind of discredit to his own brand, but he was just like, yeah, I'd do the same if I was yeah, you, man. Sure, like yeah. you've been with us for 11 years or whatever, like wow. do your own thing, like go yeah. out and just mess around and see who approaches you in chats with you and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I got chatting with Music Man because it turned out that Brian Ball, I think he's the grandson of Ernie Ball. Yes, was... Brian Sterling, uh, sorry, Ernie Sterling Brian, yeah. I think that's how it goes, is it? And yeah, and he was, I guess, for want of a better phrase, like a fan of mine. Like he used to watch, he watches my YouTube videos, follows me on Instagram, like all that kind of stuff and enjoyed what I did on the guitar and with the bands I was in. Uh, and I'd got, I'd been told by to Tosin Abassi that they'd had a chat about me. So I found that really odd and I was just like intrigued. So I wanted to meet them and I met them and we got talking and, it, and then the idea was, you know, like at the end of the day, one of the things that's really important to me was like the whole like family vibe. They're a family run mm, business still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, uh, it was a big deal to leave Chapman in the sense of like, they're my friends, like yeah, really close yeah. friends. And like, it's funny, like, even though we're talking about leaving your friends to move something else, loyalty is like a big thing for me, like being loyal to your friends yeah, yeah. And, and all that stuff. But, you know, people can misconstrue that kind of thing, if that's the right phrase, as they have online. <laughs> um, <laughs> there must be some dirt. Yeah, they're like, you're not loyal, you left Chapman. It's like, no, you don't get it. You know, when you're friends, it's not about, <laughs> yeah, it's not as black and white as that yeah. in any no, case. And a, f a, f a, a true friend would say, mate, spread your wings. Yeah. yeah. Go do your thing. That's yeah. that's what true friendship is. Which they is. have, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. and moving to Music Man is like, genuinely a cool thing. Like they're a family, they're welcome into the family. Like I, I'm not going to, jump ship from that, you know, like this is, it, yeah, feel, yeah. it genuinely feels like a new home with a bunch of incredible artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, the guitars are crazy good. Obviously, it like, goes yeah. without saying, but their guitars, the necks specifically are fantastic. Uh, there's a huge history and heritage there. And just their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like their their positivity towards me, uh, wanting to do something together was, was overwhelming for me so just like and brian's such a lovely guy we've gotten to know each other a lot better and yeah so long story short it almost felt like that was the right there wasn't another option sure yeah because yeah. there wasn't really i didn't go shopping around yeah, right. it was just a natural thing that happened and i was like well this feels right anyway mm. um so what we're we looking at then a triple neck <laughs> with a eight string bass a mandolin and a oh absolutely and a, and a, bazooki and a, and a piezo git board up the top yeah yeah <laughs> Built in Strime and Timeline, maybe. Toaster. Um, but one thing what was interesting was like uh, a lot of their necks, albeit incredible feeling, were all quite small for me. Like, right. so I've got big hands, hence this beast. Yeah. So I, I, I said to them, you know, it would be really cool to, because in a nutshell, we were designing a guitar, an artist model. Um, and I said, I'd love to have a guitar with like a, a chunky neck on it because that's what I'm used to. So they've made, I think it's the biggest neck that they do now, or wow. they will be doing, but it's really cool because it's super fat. It's much fatter down here. And then it sort of thins off a little bit up here. So if you're playing lead and stuff, it's a little, it's a little less to get in your way, mm -hmm. which apparently is unique. I had no idea. That's the opposite of what it is normally. Yeah, I didn't know. It just, in my head, I was like, that kind of makes sense. But um, yeah, so it's going to be a Sabre, which is very similar to a, it's like a S-type, you know, mm -hmm. it's like double cut, slightly offset. It's going to have my bare knuckles in it. It's going to have the, the roasted maple thing, nice and fat neck. And then, yeah, alongside that, we've actually just built this Cutlass, which will have these in it, which I don't think will be an artist model thing, but I've just asked for that guitar. Well. To play, yeah. So that I've got my heavy option. Yeah, yeah. My... So the guitar that you're you're pictured with, you're pictured with at Nam. Yeah. How close is that to what you're going to end up with or i would say i would say it's like 70 percent. oh okay we might experiment different colors there's right. going to be some structural stuff so like we're going to carve back the heel a bit more right. so that there's less wood there for the upper frets um and the, i think the hardware is changing bridge is changing uh there'll be like a push push for coil tap the oh, coil cool. split um so you haven't yeah. gone for the like deep 
cut cut away heavy rock guitar. It's it, in a way, it's a little more traditional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of st- straightforward, simple mm. kind of thing. Double humbucker. Uh, it'll have a bridge that you. It'll be like this, so the bridge can sit against the body, or you right. can you can dip it if you've got a bar. Um, and that's basically it, you know. Um, and then I think maybe at some point next year we'll start looking at designing a a signature model, which okay. will be uh, my own unique shape, which right. I've already drawn up and know what it's going to be. <laughs> so it's the Explorer. Oh yeah, cross BC Rich Mocking. Yeah, it's going to be like this, this, yeah, this, yeah. And, you know. Um, oh, that's that's well cool, mate. But it's just really feel honoured. Seeing the yeah. pictures and it's like. It's yeah, really cool. it's really well. It does set really us up nicely for, for a return, doesn't it? And we'll it'll be quicker than three years this time. Yes, yeah. uh, Cortex and a music man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If yeah. anyone is gonna drag us through the head screaming, it really ought to be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. It'd be my pleasure. <laughs> yeah, for you. you can watch me in a sad face for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it sounds like a plan, guys. I'm up for that. Right. Yeah, yeah, we're up for it too. Um, right, before we break for lunch, have we missed anything? Stormzy, check. Uh, oh, projects, what are you doing? What's your what's your band situation? So we've, we've uh, the, the total missed, I'm in the midst of recording the guitars for the second EP. So that's going to be done hopefully in middle of summer. That'll be out. Right, yeah. I'm aiming for. Uh, and then the guitarist, and so the, the, in the Totemist, the drummer is Liam Keeley from Black Peaks. Yeah. Because they disbanded as well at the start of lockdown. Okay. Like a lot of people, a lot of bands just disbanded yeah. around that time. Yeah, yeah. But Le- me and Liam did the Totemist together. And then Joe Gosney, who's the guitarist from Black Peaks as well, the two of them are obviously a tight unit from Peaks. But me and Liam became a tight unit. So we decided why not all three of us start writing. And it just turns out that Joe and I have a really similar musical palette like oh, okay. for original riffs and sounds and he loves all the ambient beds of chords and the, the more emotive chord progressions and stuff so we've started writing together we've got about i think it's seven or eight tracks towards an album now wow awesome. um and we've got a singer in mind who is currently working on some ideas which i'm not allowed to say yet even though i don't think anyone really cares but right. i'm not allowed to say yet not um, to say who it is. yeah but is it taylor swift yeah absolutely <laughs> taylor <laughs> Um, but so. with any luck, it'll all come together. I would love to see that. Yeah. Can you imagine wicked. Taylor in a prog metal I band? I actually can. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, so with any luck, that'll come together and we'll have something to show album wise next year. But with that, it's a bit more of a, these days, I'm not trying to do a band for like, I'm not, I don't need to like earn a living from a band or anything. I don't feel like I need to do that. Right. Like, so it's fun. It's more about the enjoyment of playing gigs, um, hopefully gaining fans that, that want to listen so to the cool. songs and sing to the lyrics and just try and see where it goes. Awesome. I, I feel there's pressure lifted uh, somehow over the lockdown or something. That's amazing. But that's what I want to do. Just have a band for the love of writing music and yeah. playing riffs out in, 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 uh, in I was going to say beers, in, in clubs and bars and stuff. Uh, and then hopefully do the maybe a bit more of the session stuff on the side and just carry on. So, so like, yeah, those two projects are the main musical thing, aside from me doing my own thing, which hopefully will happen soon. Amazing. Watch, watch this space then, and, and it sets us up nicely for a return in however long. All right, before we have something to eat and come back to hear the uh, anodized pit guard, mm. can you pick a sound, play something, and remember what it is? Yes. While we have lunch. <laughs> All oh, right, to to hear the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then obviously we'll we'll send Rabir off to uh, play you something really lovely. But um, I don't know something simple with a sound so that they'll hear this one. When it comes back, we'll do the same thing, and maybe we'll be able to hear a difference, or maybe we won't. Yeah. So I'm trying to think now. Should it be dry, or do you want it to have? Um, it can be whatever you like. I will record it on my phone so that we can remind ourselves when we come back into the room. I'll do bridge and neck, I guess. Right. Like, I'll do the same riff bridge and neck, so I'll just be oh, like... We need, to, we need to remember what pedals are on. Okay. Oh, that wasn't meant to be on. I could just keep it dry, just amp. We'll see you in a bit. Actually, let's do a finger click. Okay. Like Scooby Doo. Okay. 
Yeah. I mean, it was about an hour and a half ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm looking at the waveforms. They seem like whatever is happening in that guard, mm. there's less. Yeah. It's not as strident. No. As as the previous ones. Okay. We are going to get Rabia to play you out, but before we do that, we've. Oh no, not that one. So many strats, so little time. I I just feel. I, I want to feel like I'm part of the club. So I'm hanging on to this one. <laughs> um, cue a bit of VT. Here we are then. So you've just heard uh, this pick guard in this guitar. And this is a rewind to what happened before that. Indeed. And we decided over lunch that we were going to put that set there into my custom shop strap just for Scheisses and Gigales. <laughs> Shices and gigalos. Back soon. As we explained earlier, the pickups that were in that guitar are now in this guitar. They are. Obviously, the guitars are very different. Uh, that will have a, an ash body. This has an alder body. Um, I'll get Rabia to play them both in a minute, but let's have a see what they sound like in the gold guitar. Do you want a bit of verb in that or just dry? Uh, yeah, give me some help, can you? So interesting. Definitely, um, I want to say thinner, but not in a pejorative way mm. than the pickups that were in there. And that extended top end, yeah, is so in there. Can I play yours just for, for yeah. two seconds? And then I, I promise he'll play you out. But The same pickups. This guitar sounds fatter. Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah. But they're the same pickups. Yeah. 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 That yeah. is mad. And then. Quite a big difference, really. Oh, I thought I did that. Don't. I pressed the wrong button, mate. A big difference that's unreal there's some things i much prefer about that mm. the sort of fatness and the mid-range mm. yeah now it lets spark a flipping internet riot off that's all the stuff <laughs> i associate with a maple neck yeah yeah okay 
Okay. Fatter, kind of, I would say, upper mids. Mm. Like you would expect from, if you stick a humbucker in there and start playing rock, that's where you get that bark from. Mm. But equally, I'm completely aware that we could be creating a narrative here to explain what we're hearing. So yeah. it could be any of the above, couldn't it? Yeah. The pickup, for, for what it's worth, the strings are more or less the same. Beer's got um, 10 to 52 on there. Mm -hmm. There's 10 and a half to 50 on here. So these the top string is a little bit lighter. Pickup heights are the same because they're mm -hmm. adjusted the same. And our actions aren't a million miles off. This one might be like a smidge higher, maybe. Yeah. Um, cool, man. Amazing. It's quite interesting. Yeah, what do you? What were you hearing? D absolutely, that just sounds more powerful almost. I don't want to say, it's just b like bigger spectrum of sound. More like, extended more, highs. Yeah, more yeah. extended highs. Um, this I'm used to the sound of this. Like it, for me, it's it's rounder. Yeah. Um, which for me is really helpful when I start adding gain and furs and. All but you did say, stuff. didn't you, that the anodized pit guard knocks off some highs? Yeah. So again, we might have just walked into our own trap there, but <laughs> I was. Were you yeah, as soon that? as you were, as soon as it came on, it's like it's. Yeah, it's a, it's a big difference. Yeah. Wow! Killer man! Amazing! Killer! Okay, um, we'll get Rabir to play us out. Um, it's been a great day, mate. It's so good to see you. I've had such a good time. Mate, it's been no, so thank good you for having me. You. Yeah, no, you're so welcome. <laughs> can, can we convert you to wet, dry, wet, or is it just too much hassle? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I think I might mess around with it at home. I, was, I have my own studio space now. Kind of similar size to this kind of room, so I get to actually turn amps and cabs up. So nice. I'm probably going to try and give it a go myself, wet, dry, wet kind of vibe or something at home. Brilliant. Because <laughs> I've got the capacity to do that Are now. you going to be filming from there? Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm awesome. trying to trying to do lots more. The flying beast is on the front of the marshal. Yes, he is. I think we could give him the shock of our lives. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, check out all the stuff. There'll be links below. Uh, please click on that stuff. Check out Rabia's stuff. We want to say thank you to our patrons on Patreon. Indeed. Thank you so much. Massive thank you to anyone that's gone to thatpedalshowstore.com and grab some merch. Buy you t-shirts and... Buy you merch. Yes, indeed. With a nod to uh, Rabia's Carnival t-shirt today, yeah. which we don't sell. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, uh, mate, if you'd be so kind. I'll try. I will try. Right. What are we going to play with? Everything. Oh, let's start here. <laughs> <laughs>